first of all, uh, welcome to uh, Central Michigan University and, and Mount Pleasant, Michigan. For those of you who might be here uh, for the first time, it is certainly our privilege to have you here tonight, and we thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Stan Shingles, and I'll be serving as your moderator tonight for the Sports Leadership Summit entitled Critical Issues in High School Sports, a Town Hall Meeting. First of all, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, some of the great leaders who helped to put this event together. They're from the Center for Global Sports Leadership here at CMU, and it's their hard work and dedication that made tonight's event possible. Let me start by introducing the director of the Center for Global Sports Leadership here at CMU, Dr. Vincent Mumford. <laughs> Dr. Mumford, I know, would, would certainly share in uh, all of the uh, hard work and dedication that goes into putting on an, on an event such as this one. And there are two key individuals who are a major part of making tonight's event uh, possible. Let me start by uh, introducing one of the assistant directors, and he's here to my left, to your right, and that's uh, Nathan Kopp, who's an assistant director in the Institute. And also Miss Allison Wright, who's also an assistant director. Where is Allison? Allison? She's still in the hallway working as usual. And of course, there are a lot of other people who made tonight's event possible, and we certainly thank them for all of their efforts. You can learn more about tonight's summit um, and, and also all of the work being done by the Center for Global Sports Leadership by going to the website at sportsleadershipsummit.com. And also tonight, we're going to have a very unique ingredient for tonight's forum as we, as we discuss the many issues. If you have questions, we would like for you to pull out your mobile de de device or your, your, um, your laptop or, or your uh, iPad or whatever it is you may have, and you can actually email us questions at cmucgls at gmail.com. Again, that email address is cmucgsl at gmail.com. Also, we'll be taking questions through our Twitter account. And you can get to that Twitter account at hashtag 2012SLS. Again, that's hashtag 2012SLS. As it relates to the blog, this is a fully functional blog, and there will be also staff tweeting and blogging throughout this entire summit tonight. and, and actually blogging and, and, and tweeting all of tonight's updates uh, for tonight's event. As we get started, we're here for a lot of different reasons. One is to examine the critical issues facing high school sports today. And when we consider the collective reach of high school sports today, no one sector of sports can match the numbers, nor can anyone match the importance of the outcomes engendered in participation in high school sports. Our country's leaders in government, industry, medicine, and education have had their characters formed to an extraordinary degree by their participation in high school sports. For example, President Obama often cites his basketball efforts in high school growing up in Hawaii, and House Speaker John Bonner makes equal note of his football days at Cincinnati, Cincinnati Molars High School. The macro numbers are pretty striking. Over 19,000 high schools provide nearly 8 million young people opportunities to play high school sports. More people attend high school sporting events than college and professional sports events combined. At the time when budget cuts threaten the existence of many high school sports programs, leaders should recognize the key role of high school sports in developing the next generation of leaders, employees, and entrepreneurs, not to mention the current generation of consumers. Studies consistently show students who participate in high school sports make better grades, have better attendance, fewer discipline referrals, and graduate at a higher rate than a student who does not participate in high school sports. Supporting the young people who participate in high school sports will keep the door open to these programs and help us to build the leaders of tomorrow. None of the people who, have, who, who are leaders in high school sports would ever claim to rank in the top 50 most influential people in sports. However, the collective role of such leaders has an enormous influence on our nation's future and the persistence of high school sports today. Again, we welcome you to our summit, and we certainly would like to get started here tonight. 
as we begin, first of all, as we begin tonight's program, let me make sure we're in the right order here. We'd like to begin by showing you a video. So if we can, uh, if we can direct your attention to our monitors. Executive Director with the NIAAA, and we are based in Indianapolis, Indiana. We are here for the purpose. Uh, we simply exist to assist you to benefit the profession of interscholastic athletics. And whether you are a high school administrator or a middle school athletic administrator, uh, whether your title is director or assistant principal or administrator or coordinator, please know uh, that we are here to offer education, and certification, materials, and uh, support to what it is you do. We at the NIAAA feel that uh, the primary crux uh, of critical issues in high school sports today is the very existence uh, of NI triple of um, high school sports as we know them uh, today and what is the future for high school sports in schools there has been somewhat of an assault I would have to say on high school programs and most recently that's been brought on by the financial status of our nation uh, state and local level it may have meant that uh, you have faced budget reductions and thus uh, fewer numbers of sports or numbers of contests or numbers of coaches. Transportation budgets, budgets have been cut. Uh, we have heard of extreme examples of school districts uh, dropping middle school sports or uh, joining with the recreation department to let the local city rec department run their high school sports program. Uh, we received a call from New York uh, a couple of years ago. The AD had been informed that day that his position was being cut to part-time, half-time, uh, that all sports were being dropped in the district except varsity, which was a death sentence for the program, and probably the school, uh, that all extracurricular activities were being cut. There would be no sponsorships for student government or class plays or musicals. And uh, <clears throat> this gentleman was quite down and out, didn't know which way to turn, but um, the issue here is educating administrators, uh, school boards, and uh, community to the benefit of what it is we do and what it is we offer, and that when you have made those cuts, uh, even if it's a perception that we've cut everywhere else, thus athletics needs to cut, we know our percentage of the total athletic budget or the total district budget in athletics is quite small. Once you have made those cuts, then where do you cut? Uh, where will the next reductions come from? Um, to combat this, uh, we've joined in, some, in a number of efforts. And I would say beyond finances, uh, the other assaults have been the quest for the athletic scholarship and the drive for international success in athletic competition have pushed kids towards club sports. And you fully understand uh, the club sport issue. <clears throat> you may have heard most recently uh, the U.S. Soccer Developmental Academy uh, prohibiting high school kids from participation. Uh, if they're participating in their academy, no participation in high school soccer because they cite better coaching and a year-round program and that type of thing. So as a combative, the NIAAA has uh, joined a current emphasis on the promotion of the benefits of participation in high school sports in an effort to emphasize the importance to the 97% of those 7.6 million participants last year uh, who didn't receive a scholarship um, in the maturation and development as uh, citizens, and we promote the idea of being uh, helping develop good American citizens, not a primary importance of developing all Americans for college athletes. Those words uh, come from the Associate Executive Director of the National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association, uh, Mr. Uh, Mike uh, Blackburn, and we certainly appreciate him being a part of tonight's forum. Uh, we have a unique opportunity to have a very engaging 
summit here tonight. We'll be bringing you some video. We have an expert panel that I will introduce here momentarily. But more importantly, we also want to hear from you. So as I mentioned, there, there are several opportunities for you to, uh, to be a part of tonight's program, and we certainly encourage you to do so. Let me take a moment to uh, introduce tonight's panel, and it's a very esteemed panel. This panel uh, has been uh, asked to, to be assembled, and I think it's a panel of experts. They bring a lot to uh, tonight's town hall, and I'll take a moment to introduce uh, each and every one of them. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce is uh, Bethany Striffler. Bethany is in her fifth year as the athletic director for Car the Carroll High School, uh, excuse me, Carroll Community Schools. Prior to this, she was the program director at the Michigan Athletic Club in East Lansing. She's a graduate of Albion College, where she majored in exercise science and, in man and minored in management. And she also played softball for four years. She's currently in a graduate studies program here at Central Michigan University in sports administration. And in her free time, she enjoys being active outside, working out, and participating in sports, particularly competing against her fiance in tennis, racquetball, and squash. Please welcome Bethany Striffler. Our next panelist is Daniel Zitkowski, better known as Coach, Coach Ski. Currently the athletic director at Saginaw High School for the past two years, formerly the assistant AD at Saginaw High School for 13 years. He has coached at all levels and has coached baseball, golf, and football. He has spent 29 years in education and in athletics, coaching 19 years at Saginaw High School. He was born and raised in my hometown, the Windy City of Chicago. He's married with a son who actually played golf in college and is now working in minor league, minor league baseball in Augusta, Georgia. He has degrees in special education and also secondary administration. Coach Ski supports all levels of athletics, community-based, as well as high school. Please welcome Coach Ski. Our next panelist is Jim Conway. Jim is currently serving as the Mount Pleasant Public Schools Athletic Director. He's been there since 2003. He's also an Albion uh, College uh, alum, where he was also the head baseball coach for nine seasons, and also the men's athletic director for five years. He has also worked at Concordia College in Ann Arbor, and in minor league baseball with the Rockford Expos and also the Arkansas Travelers. Jim is a graduate of, of Albion with degrees in second edu secondary education and communication and has a master's degree in sports administration from the United States Sports Academy. Jim is married with two, two children, ages 16, 16 and 12. So please welcome Jim Conway. Our next panelist is Terry Baker. Terry just recently completed his career as superintendent of the Shepherd Public Schools, where he was highly involved in the passing of a $30 million bond proposal for new and improved educational facilities, athletic complexes, uh, athletic complexes and an auditorium. Although born and raised in Michigan, much of his initial coaching and education began in the state of Wyoming. Terry has been involved in several aspects of coaching, sports fundraising, including football, baseball, men's and women's basketball, and men's and women's track. He progressed in his career starting as a physical education and English teacher to assistant high school principal and athletic director to middle school principal. And Terry's sole passion throughout his career was creating better atmosphere, facilities, and opportunities for kids to learn. Please welcome Terry Baker. Michael Thayer. Michael Thayer is currently in his sixth year, excuse me, his fifth year at Bay City Western High School as a assistant principal and athletic director. This is his 15th season as an athletic director. Previously, he was an educator and also athletic director at Merrill High School, also serving as a co-op coordinator and middle school principal. He is a graduate of Central Michigan University with a business teaching degree and also a master's degree in educational administration. He's married to his wife, Linda, who will be 20 years this July. Congratulations. He has two daughters, Kelsey, who will enroll at Central Michigan University this fall, and Kennedy, who's a sophomore at Swan Valley High School. Please welcome Michael Thayer. <laughs> Ken Monet. Ken is the Director of Student Activities at Mattawan High School for, for the past 13 years. He is currently President 
of the Michigan Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association, the MIAA, and currently serves on the NIAAA Board of Directors. He has taught high school mathematics, business, and coached football, wrestling, and baseball. He brings a unique perspective as a Persian Gulf War veteran to our panel, retiring after 20 years of service in the U.S. Army and Michigan National Guard as a helicopter crew member and leadership development instructor. He has a master's in education, uh, educational leadership from that other school on the west side of the state, dare I say, <laughs> Western Michigan University. He holds a Michigan Administrator Certificate. And also, he's served on the National Board Certification Master's Athletic Administrators for the CMAA, serving as an instructor for the National AD Leadership Training Program and the Michigan High School Athletic Association Coaches Advancement Program. He's an avid traveler with his wife, who's a certified athletic trainer. Smart guy, I married one too. Uh, with three children, so please welcome Ken Monet. Marcus Harris. Marcus is in his fourth year as an athletic director, currently serving as the athletic director and the dean of students at Grand Rapids Ottawa Hills High School. He's a graduate of Grand Rapids Creston High School. He has his bachelor's degree from Grand Valley State University, and he's cur currently finishing up in the sports administration program here at Central Michigan University. Please welcome Marcus Harris. And last but not least, Dr. Scott Smith. Dr. Smith is currently the Associate Professor and Department Chairperson in the Department of Physical Education and Sport here at CMU. He's a graduate of Bluffton College, has his Master's in Education from UNLV, and his PhD from the University of Missouri at Columbia. Prior to moving into higher education full-time, Dr. Smith worked for 22 years in K-12 education, primarily in the area of athletics. He has been an athletic director in four different school districts in three different states. He's worked closely with the NIAAA as a curriculum director for the NIAAA Leadership Training Institute as well as serving as the university liaison for this association. He is recognized as a nationally known expert in the area of pay for play fees in high school sports, a phenomenon he first began to study while conducting research for his doctoral dissertation in 1999. Please welcome. Dr. Scott Smith. As you can see, we have a very experienced and esteemed panel here tonight, and we're going to take this opportunity to allow each panelist to provide for us their brief perspective of the critical issues in high school sports. So we'll start from, from uh, I guess, from, from left to right, and we'll start, we'll start here with you, Terry. Well, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to be here tonight, Dr. Mumford. Uh, it's a real um, honor. Can everybody hear me okay out there? Okay. Um, I'm surprised that you invited me, uh, being uh, just retiring in September. Um, I was lucky and very fortunate that my wife would allow, give me some time off from laundry duty to be here tonight. Um, but I'm working hard on that list that she started developing about a year ago when she found out I was going to retire. Uh, I think the two, uh, um, or two critical issues that, that come to mind for me uh, that we face today in high school sports. Um, I guess I would consider these to be two of the major ones. Certainly the financial financial picture the last few years has been terrible. And um, you know, our goal, it was a board goal, and it was my goal at Shepherd to maintain all programming for children and maintain all of our employees through those tough times. And we were lucky, fortunate to do that. It was our goal. It got tough at times. But that was our number one goal. If the employees left us, um, you know, maybe we, we didn't replace them, but we didn't lay anybody off, and then we didn't cut any programming for children. Um, so hopefully that will get better, you know, in the next few years. Um, and uh, it looks like it might. So. Uh, I think another critical issue that faces us and has faced us for a long, long time is our at-risk youth and the number of at-risk youth that we deal with. 
When I was the middle school principal at Morley Stanwood, we worked very, very hard to get our at-risk youth involved in athletics. Um, I think it's the last best chance to catch them. I think it's the last best chance to get them engaged in their education and to graduate and to become uh, good citizens down the road, good community members. And uh, I think we need to do everything within our power, especially at the middle school level. That's why I hate to see districts looking at cutting middle school sports. Because even though the arts, um, and, you know, some of the kids, the at-risk youth uh, get involved with uh, drama and vocal music and that kind of thing, some of them, you know, find their way um, and get engaged in their education through uh, those programs. But in my experience, it's been sports um, that has helped those at-risk children. So, okay. Thank you, Terry. Jim Conway. Also, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Mumford for inviting me as well. This is kind of a home game for me, so it's it's exciting to see a lot of uh, colleagues up here. I, I think the two biggest issues that that, that I see is budget number one. Um, you know, like all districts. School board members have a very difficult decision. Uh, they get it from all ends of, of uh, the, the entire community. Living in this community, you folks that are college kids probably understand the importance of, of uh, community and what Mount Pleasant Public Schools does for this community. Uh, currently, I, I, I would just round up and say about 50% of our kids at Mount Pleasant High School participate in a minimum of one sport and at Western Intermediate's our middle school it's just seventh and eighth grade and it's slightly higher so as, as uh, uh, retired Superintendent Baker alluded to it, it is important and, and that, that, that cutting of middle school sports is a very scary I have a seventh grader and and just see how kids just just gain confidence and and we don't in our conference we don't keep wins and losses. I know some moms and dads do and kids do and that type of thing, and we fight that as athletic administrators. Um, currently, I, I'll be in a meeting next week, and one of the number one topics is our, our, our mission at the middle school level is we have two teams. We have two seventh grade teams and two eighth grade teams, and I'll pick the sport of volleyball. And, and the, the guidelines are those teams are to be split evenly to get as many kids an opportunity to play because we know many of these kids aren't to the maturity level. Certainly 90% of them have not reached <laughs> their potential. We are talking about going to an A and a B to help competitiveness. Some of the districts want that. Some of those don't want that. Um, it, it's very interesting. We've been talking about it all year, and, and uh, here we come, and, and uh, it's going to get down to a vote next Thursday. And I've talked to our coaches and retired coaches and teachers and administrators, and, and um, it, it will be very interesting. So um, uh, as um, Terry mentioned, that middle school level is very, very important. 50% is a critical number in our high school, in, in our community. And um, as budgets get cut, it's, it's a difficult, it's very painful. It is very painful to take things away from kids. So I, I, I would highly um, talk about, you know, the budget and the finances are the number one critical issue. The next one is this. I have a 10th grade daughter. I have a 7th grade daughter. And I, I knew this was out there, but probably more as a parent now than as an administrator. The club sports that uh, the gentleman from the NIAAA talked about is starting to creep in. It's starting to creep in. It's been a big city issue. It is now a small city issue. It's been a LA issue. It's been a Boston area issue. It's been a Chicago issue. It is now a Shepherd issue, a Mount Pleasant issue, a Cairo, a Bay City issue. We, we, we are, we're faced now with kids that want to represent their high school, but then their parents want them to have a little bit of leeway so they can miss a practice, miss a tournament, so they can get to their AAU 
contest, and they're paying big money for the AU. So that, to, to me, that's that's another critical issue, where we all know that the small percentage of kids that get Division One scholarships. I recognize some athletes in here. You're very fortunate, but think about all your friends that you played next to in high school that did not have that opportunity. So we we, we need to focus in on the 99 percentile that this is the last go around for them, and and um, we know what we learn on the field compared to what we learn in the English. We need English, math, science, and all those wonderful things. But uh, these kids need to know what it is to start a season and to go through a season and end up as a team at the end of the season. So those are uh, a couple things on my mind. Okay. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, Marcus Harris. Okay, two of the uh, most critical issues it, in Ottawa Hills, we, we have a lot of at-risk kids in the Grand Rapids Urban District. Uh, Ottawa Hills is one of three schools, Ottawa Hills, Creston, and Union. Uh, declining enrollment, which affects finances, and declining enrollment, which also affects participation in our athletic programs. Uh, at Ottawa Hills, we have about uh, 720 students, uh, which would actually put us at a class B school, but we do have to count theme school students who participate as well, uh, which puts us at about 968. And so we have about 18% participation rate in our school. Uh, one of the things that, that really uh, hurt us, elementary, we have good enrollment. Middle school, it tinkers off, but our high, when we get to our high schools is where we're really, really missing those students. And so along with the athletic participation, uh, we get students, first of all, that come in that may not have played sports like soccer, uh, sports like tennis, and so forth. And so ultimately, we got a middle school grant, which could help with that. But we still, uh, we, we have elementary track, and we have elementary basketball. So we get a lot of students coming to our school uh, who never played baseball, never played softball. And so they're either scared to come out or uh, just don't want to play at all. So that's one of the things that really uh, hurts our participation. Again, with declining enrollment is finances, okay? Uh, if any of you are from the Grand Rapids area, there was always talk about Ottawa Hills closing uh, because out of the three schools, we have the lowest enrollment and our enrollment seems to trickle down each year. About five years ago, we were at about 1,500 students. And now we're at about 720. So declining enrollment is a huge part in our district. Uh, we're trying to figure out now how can we keep those kids, get them in our high schools. We got competition from charter schools popping up in our district. Uh, we got competition from other public schools in our district, which we compete with. Uh, so again, keeping those students, we're looking at new ways to incorporate athletics at the elementary level, at the middle school level, to ultimately keep those kids in our district. So uh, declining enrollment affects our finances, also affects our participation. Okay, hey, thank you, Marcus. Ken? I also want to thank you for having me here and thank all of you for being here. Taylor Swift has a hit song out right now and within that song, I don't know if there's any country music fans up here at Central Michigan University, but within that song, she has a lyric that says, people throw rocks at things that shine. And right now, education has rocks being thrown at it. And when education has rocks being thrown at it, uh, often the non-core programs of a school are most adversely and first affected uh, within that school district. Athletics uh, often being one of those. Two critical issues that I see, uh, not only in the state, but nationwide, the athletic administrator and coaches and the people that facilitate sports programs are continually being asked to do more with less. Uh, their jobs are expanding, their duties are expanding, but they're given less resources. And also, subsequently, you're seeing a lot more turnover within the coaching ranks and within the athletic administrator profession. Uh, so you're seeing a lot, lot of people who are going into profession that may be less uh, equipped to handle all of these issues or handle things that are going on within their community. And that's where the 
Michigan and the National Athletic Directors Association uh, comes in to uh, attempt to combat this in that their primary function is to uh, equip the people in sports management and athletic administrators and expand their capacity uh, to better handle these situations as they they come along. So again, um, athletic administrators and coaches being asked to do more with less resources and the turnover in the uh, leadership of athletic management within school districts seems to be uh, two of the most critical issues we face as a nation and a state. Hey, thank you, Ken. Dr. Smith? Thanks, Dan. This one? Pass this one on. All right. Well, I won't thank Dr. Mumford for inviting me to the panel because he didn't invite me, he made me. I'd rather be on that side of the table. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's a long list of critical issues, and some of you took part in a survey, and, and we have that list. But if you start to look at them, a lot of them are interrelated to some extent. For an example, uh, Stan said that I've done a lot of work with pay-to-play fees, and I have. Um, but so as we start to tell parents, you're going to pay $300 for your kid to play in this sport, they start to take a little more ownership in that program and they start to believe that they can now make decisions and tell coaches who should play and when they can play and what should happen you know and so therein lies that issue you identified as parents um, and, and that plus those same parents have their coach their kids out in club sports, which Jim mentioned. Now they, they of course, know more of the X's and O's than the, the coaches in our school district do. Um, so, and so that parental involvement, which we always wanted so bad, and now we're getting more than we want to some extent, is leading to the turnover uh, that we talked about. And, and I read all the time about how many in some states, the, the turnover rate among ADs is one out of three every year. Um, and so between coaches, officials, and athletic directors, we can't find enough qualified people to put, continually battle against that parental involvement. So all of these things are related to some extent. Just a piece on the financial in though the pay to play fee, which, which is probably I'm most interested in. You know, when I did a lot of my research in the beginning, we were talking about $25 and $50 fees. There was some reduced participation, but it wasn't all that bad. But you go across the country now and you look at in some states and in some districts, we're talking several hundred dollars per student per sport. Well, what happens is all of a sudden high school sport is not for everyone. High school sport is only for elite. It's for the people that can afford to pay or the students, the players who are so good that someone else will play, pay for them. And it leaves the people, the rest of the people out. And, and that's absolutely against the mission of what, what we're supposed to be about in interscholastic sports. So that's my piece. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Beth? Well, there's a, not a lot to add to what everybody's been saying because we're all, you know, talking about all the same issues and they are all interrelated. Um, I think finances is definitely the, the piece that's interwoven into almost every one of these critical issues that we all face amongst ADs and coaches across the state and nation. Um, coaching staffs is the one that I, I think is one of our critical issues because they are really the frontline staff when it comes to the interaction with your student athletes. As much as us as athletic administrators get to interact with student athletes, we have a different interaction than that day-to-day -day interaction that the coaches have. And as I would say most high school athletes, athletes can attribute, they had more uh, closer relationship and a different relationship with their coach which to me ultimately is what's developing student athletes into good citizens and good Americans. So I think that the issue, one of our biggest issues is, as Ken alluded to, is the retention of good coaches, developing those good coaches, encouraging the, the people who are in education already have that foundation to continue in the coaching field or to 
um, get into it because of their skills, not only with the sport itself, but their skills with students that is vital when it comes to coaching, not just strictly their sport knowledge. We had put higher expectations, and I, I think it was Ken also that said, but we give them less resources to do their job. And, and that's a challenge um, to any coach that's in that position. And as an AD, I, I often feel bad because I know I'm asking this, this, and that of my coach. And they do, you know, they do all of this for such a small paycheck. And nobody does it for the money, but you still want to, there's not enough thanks in the world for what coaches do. And, and I think that that's one of our biggest challenges is if you get the right coaches in there doing the right things for kids, then a lot of good things can happen um, beyond the financial challenges that we all do face. So I think that's one of our biggest challenges. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Coach Ski? Thank you, uh, Dr. Mumford. I appreciate that, Nathan, the opportunity to be here. And of course, Allison, if she's here, <clears throat> I... Uh, I'm the athletic director at Saginaw High, a proud member of the uh, Trojans, and a little CMU history and nostalgia here. Uh, we have a great graduate from Saginaw High who played football here, who was a member of the uh, New Orleans Saints uh, by the name of Tory Humphrey. So all of you who know Tory, and I mentioned Tory Humphrey to you because little known about Tory Humphrey, he was also a swimmer at Saginaw High and also a Saginaw Valley uh, all-academic uh, all and all-athletic swimmer. Now, you put Tory Humphrey, football, CMU, New Orleans Saints, Saginaw High, swimmer. Something doesn't match there sometimes. And I remember the first day I met Dr. Munford and we were talking about athletics. When I walk into Saginaw High every day, which is a proud member of the Saginaw Valley League, competing against Mount Pleasant and Bay City Western and some great teams from Midland, I walk into that building every day realizing a couple of things. I walk in there, number one, as an educator, and number two, as a member of a staff who's involved with athletics. I start my day by teaching four hours of algebra, then go and sit in an office and try to do athletic stuff. Now what I tell you about that is, is you need to understand something at Saginaw High. When I walked in there 19 years ago, we had 1,700 kids. Last MHSA count, 641. 23 athletic teams, one coach this year is a teacher in the building. That's not a critical issue. The critical issue are the athletes at Saginaw High who aren't and may not get the opportunity to experience being a member of a team, experience getting a letter, experience going and competing against a baseball team like Mount Pleasant playing against Mr. Basketball at Bay City Western, playing against St. Champs at Midland Dow in tennis. When I walk into that building, I have to try to find ways and get people to help us to realize we're dealing with kids, athletes, human beings. You take away sports from some of the people at the high, you talk about at risk. If you read the news last night, three murders in Saginaw. You saw that all over. Tonight, if you went on watch the news, we had a Draymond Green day at the high. Probably not covered as much. So the critical issue for me is not, I don't have an administrative assistant, I'm teaching four hours a day, or I have to compete against some great teams. I have to make sure that my kids have the experience to be a member of a team, because that was given to me quite a few years ago. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Coach Ski. Um, last but not least, Mike. 
Thank you, Stan, and thank you to the uh, Sports Leadership Summit for this opportunity today. It's great to see the number of athletic directors here and a number of future athletic directors or administrators at uh, schools throughout the state of Michigan or, uh, or beyond. This too often, as athletic directors, we're, we're in our own buildings, as uh, Ski has alluded to, just trying to survive our day-to-day -day opportunities that, that exist, whether it's during the school day and the number of opportunities that we have beyond being an athletic director, but it's all those responsibilities that come after school school too, uh, whether it's hosting events, getting them set up, tearing them down, or traveling to events to making sure that uh, our fan base behaves themselves and that fan base, yes, does include parents. I, I would allude, I, I, I allude to parents in, in the respect that I don't want to say that they're part of the problem or that they're the whole of the problem, but they do exist sometimes in a shell where the club sports has produced a completely different athlete. And I don't want to spend my time uh, doubling down on what has already been said about club sports, but one of the issues that we see at Bay City Western with club sports is that it's taught kids to specialize. It's taught kids to be one sport athletes. And if you know anything about one sport athletes, the biggest thing that happens to them is that the same use syndrome, the same use of the muscle power that they use, whether it's in soccer, which is one of the sports where we see the main number of injuries, we'll see kids drop out. So not only are they losing out on the sport that they love the most, but then they cannot participate at the other levels and the other sports that we offer. Um, and, and I guess that's what I would like to allude to secondly, is that yes, We'll open up the sports page and we'll read about the varsity sports that go on on a daily basis. But what about the other opportunities that exist for the freshmen, the middle school kids, the junior varsity kids, those kids that may not ever make it to that varsity level or get their name in the paper? That's what high school sports is all about. It's about participation, making sure that we provide a safe environment for them, making sure that the event goes off without a hitch, making sure that we communicate with athletic directors on a daily basis. And trust me, if you could see our emails and uh, accounts that go back and forth, whether it's texting, uh, if you think college students text a lot, you, all should, you should follow an athletic director on a daily basis as far as trying to make sure that those events happen on a, on a daily basis without error. It is not an easy thing to do, but it is one of the best things that you can do because you can help the youth at all levels, whether it's at risk, the average athlete, the elite athlete, you can make a difference and that's what high school sports is all about. Okay, thank you to our uh, panel for those uh, opening thoughts. How about a big round of applause, please? We look forward tonight to uh, offering you a, a pretty u unique uh, perspective. Uh, we were expecting to have tonight Senator Joanne Emmons was scheduled to be here tonight, but unfortunately she had a family emergency uh, in Ohio, so she certainly uh, sends her regrets that she was unable to be here. Her uh, discussion was going to be, uh, or comments were going to be based on uh, the impact of, of legislation on high school sports today. So we, we certainly missed that and, and hopefully we'll find another opportunity to, uh, to hear from uh, Senator Emmons. Uh, also want to recognize we have a, a very uh, esteemed and invited uh, group of um, faculty uh, administrators and, and, uh, and others who are here today that we've asked to, uh, to join us. They're sitting in the first uh, five rows here and uh, we would love to hear from you. If you have questions, there's, uh, there's paper on the table. Please pass those forward and we would certainly, um, certainly address those. And again, we appreciate you joining us here tonight. Also, we have the pleasure of having Mac3 TV here and I just saw Jan Howard, the general manager, just walk in and we're, we're glad that they're here tonight because they're actually videotaping this and it's the intent of the Institute to provide the opportunity uh, for DVDs to become available so that you can take these uh, comments of, from our panel and the discussion that we're having during this town hall back to your schools, to your school districts, to your administrators and hopefully that will influence some things and, and make a difference. Uh, as we move forward, we, we, as we look at this, this town hall, obviously we want lots of different perspectives. And I think we have a very unique perspective coming up uh, for you. And unfortunately, uh, she wished that she could be here, but she could not. And she's a person that I've known for a number of years. And I think brings a very unique perspective because not only was she, uh, was she, did she have the opportunity to play high school sports, but she came to Central Michigan University on a basketball scholarship, had lots of success here as a player, and has gone on to have an outstanding career as a women's basketball coach. And we'd like to now turn your attention to our screen, and we have some comments from the head women's basketball coach at Michigan State University, Susie Merchant. 
Susie Merchant, the head basketball coach here at Michigan State, and I'm thrilled to be part of the Sports Leadership Summit panel at Central Michigan that's being hosted there on your campus today. And I'm really excited because I really value what high school sports gives to young people. And I think it's beyond, obviously, the sports that they play. I think there's so much value that comes from people that um, really give to kids, and that's the teachers and the coaches and the administrators that believe in what's important in high school sports. To me, there's three things that I see that come out of um, kids participating in high school sports. First, vision. It teaches them how to set goals. And it's really important in life to be able to go after your dreams and accomplish those goals. And it gives them an opportunity to have great vision for where they want to go and what they want to do. I think it instills values in them that are critically important. First and foremost, I think you can't get anywhere in life if you're not willing to work for it. So work ethic is critical. I think it teaches great character and the last thing it does is it teaches them to have passion for a sport that they love. And then the last thing that I'll tell you that I think um, sports brings is having that voice. And I think this is something that's really important now in the age of technology. You see a lot of text messaging and Twitter and Facebook and all those things bring a lot of really great opportunities to connect with people. But I think sports puts those things away and it gets them to connect with each other and build relationships, which is so critically important. And within that, within having a voice, it, it starts to develop leadership skills and um, having to say some things that maybe aren't easy to say to people and um, but are necessary. So I think the communicating piece, the ability to connect with people within, within your own voice and in your own way is really important. So those are some things that I really wanted to share with the group today. And I wish I could be there. And I apologize that I'm not able to attend. Um, but I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you today. Thank you. We certainly appreciate uh, Coach Merchant uh, bringing those, uh, those thoughts. Again, she really wished that she could be here, but her schedule did not allow, and we certainly appreciate her taking the time to send some thoughts our way. And I think her, her thoughts are very consistent with some of the, the comments of our panel here tonight. So as you can, as you can see, uh, several themes are really starting to emerge. And I think as we start to think about the, the critical issues uh, that, we're, uh, that we're faced with today in high school sports, uh, the issues that we'll continue to, to discuss tonight were developed from a comprehensive survey conducted by the Center for Global Sports Leadership here at CMU. And this survey was conducted statewide, and I know many in this room participated uh, in that survey. And there were five critical issues that emerged from that from that survey, and these are the five, as you, and you've heard some of the themes already, you know, the financial or the finance, parents, coaches' education and quality, participation rates, and facilities. So those are the five issues, and we're gonna turn now back to our, to our panel and ask them to, to give us a little bit more in-depth perspective on some of the, some of the issues that we've, um, that, that, that have now emerged in this particular survey and ask them to provide their, their expertise. So let me start with uh, Ken. And uh, Ken is a, a person who has spent a lot of time understanding finances in high school sports. So Ken, if you can give us your thoughts on the more in-depth issues that are facing uh, high school sports from a financial standpoint. Absolutely. In my school, I'm the director of student activities, which means under my umbrella, I have athletics, fine and performing arts programs, and all of the student clubs and organizations. And I want to make the point that when schools have a budget crisis or a budget cut. Um, athletics is not exclusive in those cuts. For instance, uh, I know from being the activities director that the fine and performing arts programs have had uh, just as heavy cuts as the athletic program has. And everybody's fighting for that same district dollar. The clubs that our school district used to sponsor uh, are no longer uh, sponsored by the general fund. They now have to also fundraise uh, to operate um, for the activities that they participate in. The first thing schools often look at are non-core programs uh, such as language arts or um, art or uh, drafting classes and, and those types of things. So it's not exclusive to athletics. What you're seeing throughout the state and throughout the country for that matter because of the budget uh, situation, 
are schools operating differently than what maybe you're familiar with or what you're used to when, when you were a student athlete. I know that when I was a uh, student athlete, it was unheard of in high school to have my parents drive me to an event. It was unheard of to have a bus drop us off and then I had to find some way to get home. Uh, that's fairly common throughout the country these days. In our district, 20 years ago, we had a very strict policy against signage and sponsorship and fundraising. Uh, all of those have been uh, pretty much relaxed over the last seven to eight years uh, because it's a necessity to have that community relation and have that uh, vendor and, and sponsorship relation in order to fund our uh, programs because the district general fund dollar just isn't there. You're seeing a lot of school districts go to what we call zero-based budgeting, which means instead of being presented with an allocated amount of money to spend per year, you basically have to beg and claw and justify every expenditure that you're asking the district to, uh, to um, give toward your program. So those are some of the, uh, the issues that we're seeing lately. And again, not only in this state, but throughout the country, uh, we're seeing that same dynamic. Okay. Terry, you've served in a role as a, as a superintendent, and, and as, as Ken talked about the various issues, obviously as the lead administrator in your school district, you've had the opportunity to prioritize and, and, and make decisions and bring things to the school board. Can you talk about some of the dynamics of, of finances and how they affect high school athletics today? Well, you know, certainly Shepherd is a small school district compared to, you know, the other districts, some of the other people that are sitting here at this table. Um, we our athletic budget was about $225,000 a year. 165000 of that was coaches' salaries. Um, out of $16 million in, in providing the services and, and, uh, the learning opportunities for all those kids, that's a drop in the bucket. I think that uh, that's why, luckily, I had a board that was convinced that student programming was important. And we didn't, and like I mentioned earlier, we didn't cut any student programs, um, athletic or non-athletic during the, the hard times. And we didn't lay off any of our employees, but that was a goal of ours and um, and people knew it and they knew we were going to do everything we could from the top to ensure that that funding and you know like again I said two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars that did not include transportation transportation was about ran between fifty and sixty thousand a year but um, you know it, it's a very small price to pay for the wonderful experiences that the students were able to receive. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Scott, you, you talked earlier about the play for, uh, pay for play model, and you've obviously done a lot of research uh, as part of your dissertation with that. Can you talk about uh, conceptually some of the things that, that you've been involved with that, that can help people to better understand some of the impact of, of finances? Well, the real issue on, on the pay to play piece is, is what can your district and or community afford without driving kids out of your program? Um, and, and I've seen that threshold rise in the last few years, but I think we're going over it in a number of cases. Uh, I, I think there's no doubt that we're seeing fees now that will drive kids and parents out of the program. They just can't afford um, those kinds of dollars. Um, Particularly what you're going to see is you're going to see multi-sport athletes quit playing their second and third sport. And so it's going to lead to even more increased specialization. They'll, they'll pay their $300 to play football, but eh, I don't think I'm going to wrestle or run track this year. It's just not worth the money. Uh, the other thing you're going to see is the people who don't get to set, set foot on the field much on Friday night or on the court, 
uh, are not going to pay $300 to sit on the bench anymore. So you're going to start to, to lose participants that are second, third stringers that are part of your program, uh, and you're going to start to see people play single sport even more when you start to see the kind of fees that we're seeing. So as administrators, the key is not, in my opinion, it's not, it's not much of a question anymore of will we have fees, it's more when will we have fees and, and how will we implement them and how can we best implement them to do the least amount of damage to the program and, and how much can we truly afford in this district, how do we take care of the truly low income who cannot afford the fees and, and those kinds of issues. And I would say I'm most familiar with the Michigan and Ohio schools, and both of those states are probably, if, if not over, they're at 50 percent of um, almost one out of every two schools in Michigan and Ohio now charge a fee of some kind. You know, so again, it's not a matter of when, it's a matter of if and how, I think. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to the next uh, issue, parents. And I'm going to ask uh, Jim Conway to, uh, to address some of the issues uh, related to parents. I think it's a good segue coming off the uh, financial piece, and, and Dr. Smith's exactly right, where we, we get a lot of questions. At Mount Pleasant High School, it's $200 a sport, and the kids pay for their first two sports. And then we have a family cap of $500, and that's 7 through 12. So if you are a three-sport athlete, you have a sibling, uh, your third sport may be free. Um, but uh, the specifics with parents, they look at a lot of those things. Is this worth it? Um, certainly when things don't go well at the high school level, don't hear much about at the middle school level, at the high school level, where kids, it's playing time or limited playing time, or kids get cut. It's always to the athletic director, do you know how much we paid to go to this clinic? He, he or she had a private tutor, and that private tutor said, that they have the best jump shot in the city or those types of things. That, that's where the parent issue, kind of a false sense of security, if you will. You can kind of pay your way for your sons and daughters to, to get on athletic teams. I'm very proud of our, of our coaching staff. Um, we're very fortunate. The opposite of ski, I have close to 50% that are, that are within my school district that are employed by our school district, which is huge. Uh, all of our coaches are, are probably within 20, 25 miles of, of the high school or the middle school. So I, I'm a little bit different. We're, we're fortunate. We're in a college town. I think that helps. Um, so so I, I count my blessings there. But um, the, the parent issues come where, where they're getting miss messages, I guess. Mixed messages, if you will. Uh, just a personal story. Last year, I have a cousin that's just, uh, uh, I call it my lake house. It's actually my cousin's house, but she lets me call it my lake house down near Ann Arbor, Michigan. I happened to be down there around the 4th of July. A friend of mine called me from Farmington and said, hey, think about your daughter um, going to Michigan's hitting camp. She's a softball player. It's 50 bucks for two days. I said, hey, I'll meet you there. Great. Daughter wanted to go. I drove her over, uh, enrolled her, paid the 50 bucks, went and played golf for a couple hours, went and picked her up, spent the night at the lake house, did the same thing the next day. Within two or three days, back in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, I probably had a dozen parents approach me and say, did your daughter get invited to Michigan softball camp? I heard they paid her way. You know, it's just, it's missed messages. Are, are you trying to get your daughter in line to go to University of Michigan gym? No. I, I got my daughter with a friend of mine's daughter. We were in the neighborhood and, and uh, you know, th I thought it was a small fee to pay for her to get six hours of, of hitting lessons. But immediately, a lot of parents jump to the conclusion that I'm getting her in position to get a Division I scholarship. I hope she gets a Division I scholarship. I hope it's in math, science, English, <laughs> because she'll have a lot more opportunities and, and she'll have a bigger decision to make that way at what school she wants to attend. Um, and being in education, I know there's a whole lot of dollar out there. Um, Beth can attest to this. I mean, we're both little Albion College graduates and, and I was fortunate to coach there. And, you know, my kids were 
were paying when I was coaching there was eighteen, nineteen, twenty thousand dollars to go to school there. And so as a coach, I didn't have athletic scholarship. I felt very good when kids enrolled and graduate. We, we made graduation a big deal because it was important because those kids went to Albion College to get a degree. They're all making a whole lot more money than I am, but that's okay. And, and I'm proud of each and every one of them. But I said to those parents, they would say, Jim, why, why would I why would I send my son to Albion College? It's $18,000, can go to Michigan State or Central for, for less. The kids are like, well, that was a deal back then, but um, for less. And I said, well, you know, there's a value there. They're not necessarily paying to play on the baseball team. They're paying for a quality education, and they get four more years to play baseball. So I, I, I talk about that a lot to our parents. I think it's that false sense of security with parents. They're trying to get their kids in line, these these coast-to-coast -coast and these East-West ambassadorship. I had a hockey parent call me a couple, a couple months ago. They got a letter in the mail, dear hockey player. 3500 bucks to go overseas and play five hockey games. And I just, I, I shut that right off with those parents and said, you need, really need to look at this. It's not, if your son is good enough, they're going to find him. Um, so I, I see that's, that's a real issue with parent. I think with split homes now, we all, we're all aware of the divorce rate. I, I think parents are busy. I think a lot of times uh, this day and age, parents want a parent by sending a kid to a camp. And then when things don't go well, they really turn into a parent um, defending their sons and daughters with playing time and this and that. So uh, parents are critical. We, we, try to, we, we, we try to include them because they're a big part of this, obviously. But uh, they certainly are part of uh, the issues at uh, the high school level. Okay, thank you, Jim. Let's move on to the, to, to the next issue of coaches' education and uh, quality. Beth, why don't we start with you? Um, as I talked about uh, initially, I think coaches' education is a, a huge piece to their quality. I mean, there, there are some, my, my famous saying with a lot of my coaches and amongst ADs, I guess, that I share personally is, if they get it, they get it, and if they don't, I can't teach it to them. And there is a certain aspect of that. However, there are a lot of opportunities for coaches to develop their skills if they stay in the sport long enough. And to totally piggyback on what Jim was saying in regards to parents, a lot of times parents are the biggest challenges for coaches and why they just decide it's not worth it for them anymore. They put a lot of time in, away from their families, away from other things that they enjoy. And, and every coach enjoys what they do or else they wouldn't be doing it, at least on some level. But we ask a lot of them, um, and, and they do, they, they go way beyond just uh, the education that a teacher provides in a classroom. There's the academic education that a teacher provides in the classroom, and, and the coach is doing similar types of activities. And in some regards, they have the advantage of those, those students are choosing to be there, where in a classroom they often aren't. But they also face other challenges with, with student athletes, um, with the parental involvement. One of the saddest things that I see, and I guess this, this again goes a little bit more to the parent end in regards to the relationship with coaches, but the number of complaints that I receive about athletics or you know critical issues in the minds of either athletes or parents in regards to, to athletics as opposed to what my principal gets as far as challenges with academics. And, and certainly athletics, we all believe, is a huge part of the educational process or else we wouldn't be in, in this field. However, the academic piece is huge too and, and sometimes I wish that, that that was more obvious to all those involved, including parents. But I think that the things that we can do as an athletic administrator athletic administrators in regards to, to coaches is to pro provide them with opportunities to interact and to be educated and to get better at what they do and to provide the support that they need because they do need a lot of support, whether it's just moral support because you're not going to win every game even though everyone somehow expects you to at times, especially at the, at the higher levels, varsity levels. Um, it's, sometimes it's just a letting them realize that they are doing a good job even if they don't necessarily feel it and the wins and loss records isn't the only thing that matter to us as athletic administrators. There's so much that goes beyond that that I expect from my 
coaches that, yeah, certainly, it's fun to watch kids win and succeed. You definitely want to see that. Um, you want them to taste what that, that's like. But they also have to learn a lot more in regards to uh, the athletic experience. And I expect my coaches to be providing that type of education, not only in the game situations, but more so in the practice situations. Um, we are fortunate in Michigan to have a great CAP program, which I assume some of the students are familiar with here, but all athletic administrators are familiar with. And it's a fantastic program that the MHSAA offers to our coaches for very minimal cost. Um, it provides education from almost every angle of coaching. And whether you're a new coach or a veteran coach, you, you can take something away from that program. So that's one avenue that we have to provide for our coaches. But unfortunately, again, because we put so much on our coaches as far as time and expectations, seasons are long. There's a lot of pressure to do a lot of out of season, you know, working with athletes two or three at a time or in the weight room. Um, that, you know, to ask them then to go to a CAP program, even with the quality that we are able to offer, the, you know, I give up another weekend when I'm out of season, you know, things like that. The, those are the challenges in regards to quality coaches and, and keeping them. And I'm jealous of Jim that he has 50% of his coaches that are on staff because that's awesome. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Let's keep uh, moving on here. The next topic uh, that we want uh, to address or the next uh, critical issue uh, is participation rates. And we'll, we'll give uh, Coach Ski a... I know he gave some interesting statistics in terms of uh, coaching, education, and quality, but talk a little bit about particip uh, participation at Saginaw High School. Uh, when, when I look at participation at Saginaw High, there's <clears throat> a couple of facets that you also need to be aware of. One of the things that we instituted at the high last year was uh, called a mandatory study table. So all of our athletes uh, must attend study table at least twice a week. Now, that presents a problem because the study table is held at 3.15 to 4 o'clock. Now, we do that because my coaches maybe can get to the building by 4 o'clock. Then I have to find teachers to help out in the four core subject areas where the kids need some help. And we open it up to all the students, of course, at the high, so at least we can offer them some support, too. So when we look at participation in athletics, uh, if you think of the high, uh, we only had this year for varsity basketball tryouts, we only had 187 guys try out for the varsity team, okay? I left the high this afternoon with 14 guys on the baseball field. Okay, 18 girls on the soccer field, nine girls on the tennis court, 28 men, young men, on the track this year. Last year we had six, and 14 girls for track practice. And four guys left this afternoon to go play golf. So when you look at participation and you look at numbers, Oh, and we only had a total of 41 guys play football this year, too. So when you look at participation for me or for my coaches, it's a reality factor of who do I have to play? And it only cost us, and I say only, cost an individual at Saginaw High $10 a sport to play to carry and cover catastrophic insurance. That's not gonna happen next year. We need to go to this pay to play. We need to find someone to help us with our budget. But when we look at participation, we also have to look at the other part of that, and that is academics, because we need to have our students know, as Draymond Green said today, he may get drafted, he may not get drafted, but he told everybody today his degree that he got in four years will get him participating somewhere. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Mike, would you like to add, I know you guys are in the same league, 
uh, the Saginaw Valley League, obviously, um, Coach referenced you having the uh, Mr. Basketball this year. And uh, talk, about your, talk about your situation uh, at Bay City Western. Yeah, having the honor of uh, competing against Ski in Saginaw Valley League, his, uh, he in, uh, alluded to it. He has 640 kids. They choose to play up every year to Class A, and they win the Class A state basketball title. So playing Saginaw High every year, of those 187 kids, the 173 that are left could probably start on any one of our basketball teams that, <laughs> that Jim would, would, could attest to also. They're uh, a wonderful crew, and uh, we, we certainly uh, enjoy the opportunity to play. With the change in format next year, we now get to play them twice a year. Uh, so we're looking forward to the challenge. But uh, sort of a segue into that, uh, alluding to participation rates, um, that's what drives participation rates, and that is being competitive. Uh, putting out a product, the high school sport, as a productive opportunity. And when I say productive, Beth mentioned it too. It's not all wins and losses. It's the opportunity. It's the opportunity to participate, to do well, to learn from a loss. Many of us in here have interviewed. We finished second place in an interview before. It's not very nice. It's disappointing. We don't win every game that we participate in, but we learn from the losses, and that's what makes us a better person, a better team. That's what makes our coaching staff better teachers. The CAP program was already mentioned. That increases participation rates because coaches become better. If it were just about coaching, we would keep them longer. It's not. Coaching is much more involved. It is not just a four-month commitment during the time that you are coaching that particular sport. It's year-round. It's fundraising. That's not a lot of fun. It's pushing cans and bottles through a can returner on a Saturday, and it's, pretty, it's a dirty job. That's not a lot of fun, but that's how a lot of these programs are funded. That's what gets kids involved, and that is keep keeping our coaches in the sport that they love and enjoy. If they happen to be teachers, if they happen to be on staff, that's all the better. We have about a 35% rate at Bay City Western for the coaches who are also teachers or within the building structure that we have. 35% is pretty good. 50% is phenomenal. Many districts, there's a number of athletic directors here that if they could have the microphone, they would give you the same number probably too. It would be rare to hear something over 50%. Coaching is a difficult job. Getting kids to participate is a difficult job. There are a number of factors that drive kids away. We mentioned the, the uh, pay to participate fees, but parents play a role in that also. It is a demanding job to be a parent of a student athlete. You, we mentioned about transportation issues, getting kids back and forth to events. You're right, it was unheard of back in the day to have your mom or dad bring you to an athletic event or to bring you home. Part of being a, on a team and to learn from it is the opportunity to be with that team full time. Win or lose, you're traveling with them, you're coming home with them, you're bonding. And that's what it's all about. It increases the opportunities that kids get to be with other, to make other friends, to be in a diverse community, to be in a diverse opportunity, to learn from mistakes and to grow from them. Uh, participation rates, we hope that they would continue to grow, but it takes a lot. And it takes coaches stepping out of their comfort zone sometimes and being in these coaches' advancement program. I happen to go through it too. It's six segments, six hours a day, or six hours a session, 36 hours in total. We happen to have a couple of CAP instructors in the audience today. They do a wonderful job of making sure that our coaches continue to provide the best product that they can for their student athletes and to keep them involved. All right, thank you. Um, the last area that, that we'd like to uh, address tonight uh, with our five different issues, our facilities. And I'm going to ask Marcus um, to address that and in, in his perspective uh, over in Grand Rapids. Turn it on. Probably my biggest issue with uh, facilities is getting our maintenance to keep the fields up up, in, up in, in good condition. So that's probably the biggest issue with facilities. But uh, I was at Central High School uh, before I was at Ottawa Hill. Central High School is a school they uh, pretty much shut down and are using for uh, some, some of our theme schools. But Central High School is also known as the oldest high school in the state of Michigan. And so facilities were hard to come by, especially when it came to spring sports. 
okay? Uh, we had to work out an agreement with the city uh, because our soccer field was located at a city park, which is about five miles. Our baseball field was at another park, about five or six miles. And so track, about another three miles. So we had no outdoor facilities at Central High School. Also, another high school, Creston Art, is in the same condition. When I went to Ottawa, I was thankful because all of the facilities are located at the high school, which was much easier. We have a softball field, baseball field, we have our track. Although we do share uh, our football field, we have a, a football field in the a, in a middle of Grand Rapids, which all of our three high schools have to share. And so, actually, one position that I'm in right now is looking for a facility to play my home football games next year because the other two high schools in our district uh, left me out. And so they're going to be crisscrossing with the schedule. And so I'm up looking for games uh, to host, host our football games. But our facilities are, uh, for the most part, they're in very good condition. Ottawa Hills was built, built in 1976. Uh, and, and like I said, when I went to Ottawa Hills, I, I thought I was in luxury compared to where I was at. Now, we have a lot of students in the sports administration program. You probably took the uh, risk management class. And after going through that class, I saw we had issues uh, because looking at the gyms and looking at our pool, came to find out that there were significant issues that need to be uh, looked at. And so uh, with that said, you know, our facility is very good to be, uh, to, to be from 1976. There are some renovations that need to be done. There's some serious safety concerns in our building, which after the risk assessment that I brought towards our service building, our maintenance department, so they're going to be taking a look at those things. But overall, I like the conditions of our facilities for our high school athletes. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Well, as you can see, uh, there's a lot of different themes uh, that have emerged here tonight from the, the five issues that we've discussed. And I know the, the goal of this, of this summit and of this uh, town hall was to start moving towards solution. So we'd certainly like to hear from you uh, right now, as well as to take a few moments to focus on the number one critical issue that emerged from the survey, and that was finance. And you heard that uh, throughout participation, coaches' education, uh, facilities, and the like, because that seems to be certainly the common denominator for all of the, um, the critical issues that, are, that we're facing in high school sports today. So we want to talk a little bit about solutions. So I'm just going to ask uh, each person to give us just a very quick idea and perspective of what you think some of the solutions can be uh, to the financial issues. And again, we would love to hear from you so that we can uh, make this a little bit more interactive. Again, we can get you through Twitter, we can get you through the website, and our, our folks here up front, please uh, write down your questions and we'll get to those as well. So why don't we just start uh, on the far end with you, Terry, and we'll just work our way back this way. I mean, I'm sorry, Terry, right here, and work our way that way. I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. Um, I think at the uh, federal and state level, we need to try to let those people know they're making the decisions about finance uh, and, and how schools are funded, how important it is that kids be allowed to participate in these programs. You know, we had pay to play for one year at Shepherd. We had $50 for a high school sport, $25 for a middle school sport, and none of the board members or myself wanted to do that, but we did. The next year, we took it away. Um, I think, I'll just tell you a quick story. I had, when I was a middle school principal at Morley Stanwood, I had a fifth grader that was probably the most at-risk fifth grader I'd ever been around. And when I would take him home, when I would have to suspend him from school, um, I would talk to him about how important it was to be involved in school. And, and, and I talked to him about how important it would be if he would get involved in athletics. I mean, he was headed for incarceration. There's no doubt about it. I think he was going to spend the majority of his life in prison. And I would take him to his grandmother's when I took him home because 
His mom and dad worked in Grand Rapids, and they'd leave about 5.30 in the morning, and they wouldn't get home until 7, 8 o'clock at night, and that's if they only stopped at one bar on the way home. We changed that young man's life around because we got him involved in athletics at the middle school level. He ended up being state champion in the discus. He was all conference his junior and senior years in football and basketball. Went to uh, college and played a little basketball. Um, those are the kind of stories that those people have got to hear. And then they've got to think about just how important it is that um, the funding for our schools does include uh, the opportunities for our kids to um, participate in, in athletics and fine arts programs. Okay, thank you. Jim? I, I would agree with Terry that it's, it's, it's not a Mount Pleasant issue, it's not a Shepherd issue, it's not a Grand Rapids issue, it's a state of Michigan issue. It's, it's uh, with the downturn in our economy in the Midwest and across, across the country, some things got to change. So the folks in Lansing, uh, I, I know we, we have a very strong teachers association, union if you will, um, th th that are very vocal and, and we know that's where it's got to start um, down in Lansing. I interesting fact, we were just talking about before, before the um, seminar got started. For the first time that I'm aware of, and these uh, ladies and gentlemen correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but the MHSA were designated per student in our school. That's how your class A, that's how your class B. And some of you that are from larger schools, to be a class A high school next year, you only have to have, only have to have 911 kids. That 911 and above is now Class A in the state of Michigan. Families are flocking out of the state of Michigan. Therefore, families are leaving my school district. They're leaving Grand Rapids. They're leaving Kalamazoo. They're leaving Cairo. That, that, that is the issue. Um, as, as health insurance rates go up and student enrollment goes down, it is a ticking time bomb, as you know. Um, it's very difficult. On the local level, to solve this, and, and I, I don't, I, I'm not a very good self-promoter. Um, we try to provide our school board, our, our decision makers, statistics, and, and uh, I, I think they know deep down that, that athletics is very important, and we, we showed statistics as to how many kids participate, and, and uh, GPAs are higher, and a lot of things that we've talked about, all the positive things. I, I'm not sure that's enough right now. It, it is a, it's a large economic issue um, in the state of Michigan. Again. But uh, we're going to keep fighting the fight. I, 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 be, before I get shut off here, I just want to, I, I, can, I can tell you a quick story about Mount Pleasant Public Schools. We were cut. Um, probably because I'm not very smart. I refuse to eliminate sports. I think we can do it. We, we raise the rent. It's $7 to get into a var varsity event at Mount Pleasant High. Uh, we also took the, the uh, participation rate, you know, pay to play, if you will, up to, you know, $200. In the end, when it got down to it, I had to report to my superintendent and the board how we were going to uh, balance things. Our booster club, allotted, awarded, I don't know what the word was, $66,000. That's just to get us to a starting point. And, and uh, they, they have paid that bill. So the issue is now the booster club used to be there to buy nice jackets or to buy uh, another, uh, build another dugout. Booster clubs now are there to help finance athletics, uh, much like a lot of these said, can drives and this and that. So it, it is a, uh, it, it's a very large issue. I know our booster club is the best one in the state. I'll, I'll put it out there. It's wonderful. But we cannot continue to raise the amount of money that it's going to take un unless uh, things change quickly. As I had mentioned earlier, uh, enrollment is an issue in our school. Our superintendent met with every administrator. Uh, our new superintendent met with every administrator about two months ago when she first came on board. She also met with every single teacher. And she made notice enrollment continues to decline. St staff is going to decline as well. 
And so we know this. We also tell our coaches. Our coaches are part of educational athletics. So uh, with all the work our superintendent, our administrators are doing at the state level, we always ask what can our coaches do to help with finances, okay? We put in our national coaching standards, in our coaches evaluation tool, that they have to raise 10% of the budget, okay? More is necessary, of course, but we do ask our coaches, uh, it's an expectation that they're gonna raise money. So uh, on top of all the other things that the coaches have to do, raising money is a key piece as well. Also, getting the elementary schools involved, the middle schools involved. We've been so lucky uh, that the DeVosses has helped out in our school district, providing us with a $5 million grant. Our Student Advancement Foundation uh, providing support to provide uh, elementary level programming. But our coaches have to do more uh, to help suffice that cost as well. Uh, we're, we, we're a mirror image of what Saginaw High uh, was saying as far as participation. Uh, we don't have a fee to play. We do have a $10 insurance, and so there's no cost to the students. God knows if we did have a fee, uh, how many students we would be participating. But our coaches uh, are gonna have to fundraise. We're gonna look at new avenues of raising money. Again, we had a policy uh, which uh, we didn't let banners in our school, and so we, we, we are also looking at that as an approach to raise money. So now with the situation that we're in, we're all looking at how can we raise money and thinking outside the box now. So uh, finances continues to be a problem, but one of the things we wanna do is get those students back in our district and uh, that'll help as well. Aside from the fundraising and cuts and thinking outside the box, it's extremely important that future leaders in interscholastic athletics continue to uh, not only promote the values of what we stand for, but to educate your school board, your teaching staff, your coaches, and your community on why having an interscholastic sports program is extremely important for your community. And that's not gonna solve all your budget problems, but it's going to generate that awareness so that people are less likely to uh, target the athletic programs as a possible budget cuts, and they're less likely to throw those stones. The values that you all know of, because you were all probably associated with sports at some time in your life and you've been a student athlete, you know what that participation in athletics and, and fine and performing arts and other clubs has done for you as an individual. It's important that schools tap in to those students who have gone out and been successful, who are are obtaining their college degrees and bring those students back to tell the story of what participation in the school programs has done uh, so that your community understands that value. I teach a sport fundraising class in our sport management program uh, to both graduates and undergraduates. Um, I guess we were looking looking ahead down uh, a few years ago. We require our students to take a sport fundraising class. I think we're one of the few sport management programs that have a required fundraising class in the curriculum. Um, one of the things I say to them is when your budget revenues and expenditures aren't going to match, you got three choices. You, you go to your, the funding organization, which means you go to the school board and ask for more money, which in today's world is a joke, uh, or you look and see if you're spending your money wisely and you, you cut those things you don't need, which we've already done, and the third option is you raise more money. And so, unfortunately, athletic directors today know that a bi a, probably the, one of the biggest pieces of their job is how am I going to pay for this program without cutting it? Um, and I think all bets are off, as some folks have said. You've got to think outside the box. We're, we have signs hanging in our gyms now that we never thought we would do. Uh, sponsorship's fine as long as you're, you're careful and, and it's appropriate. Um, sometimes you're going to have to convince your community and your school board that that's an okay thing to do at the high school level because we, we stayed away from it as long as we could, but we no longer can do that. Um, you know, the pay to play, it, it's here. Most districts are going to have it. 
what's the best way to implement it? Uh, and, and as far as, as fundraising projects themselves, um, just one of the trends I think I'm starting to see is to try and get away from a lot of the nickel and dime stuff as as in the corner car wash and the candy bar sales and and to do less but larger projects and I think the Mount Pleasant High School Booster Club is an excellent example of that where they do three or four major things a year uh, that raise lots of dollars and try to stay away from the smaller things. I think the solution to most of these issues really comes down to being creative and collaborative with those that are not only within your school district and your school board, but with other athletic administrators. This, and this type of an environment is a good environment for not only coaches and administrators, but also future individuals that will be in those programs and in those positions to make the difficult decisions to get together to talk the reality of what problems do exist and what solutions um, we can come to together. Because even though there are differences in every one of our schools, of every AD that's sitting at this table, they all have a common theme and there are ways that we can help each other in, in those issues. We were all probably mostly team, team sport athletes at some point in our lives and I think that solutions generally come better if you work together with one another since they are challenges that we all do face at this time. I don't have the answer to that question but Jim I'm glad you mentioned booster clubs because nobody has talked about them tonight. Uh, I live in Midland. Midland had what was called the Booster Bash. Midland Dow and Midland High, God forbid that happened, got together and had a fundraiser, 25 bucks a head. Uh, this is being recorded. Midland has not let that amount out yet, but I'm sure they did very well. Uh, Jim talks about $67,000 coming from his Booster Club. Uh, I have five people that take care of the concession stand at Saginaw High. But I do have a great booster club, a guy by the name of Lamar Woodley, <laughs> who I can call and he'll help support because he understands the importance of giving those kids an opportunity to do something. <laughs> Skis doing a great job of name dropping all these uh, wonderful athletes that we get to play against every uh, week in the Saginaw Valley League. To me, I guess the solution to the financial question is uh, just bottom line, getting kids involved. And not just athletics, it's band, it's drama, it's student council. These kids getting involved will increase their opportunity to stay involved at school. They'll get a better education. The opportunities increase at the next level uh, where they will get their degrees. They'll come back to the communities where they grew up in. They will have children. They will be better educated. And we will be able to come full circle by having a positive uh, environment throughout the sports and in the uh, academic world that the, the parents will eventually grow up in and uh, have their children with. And it, it is an opportunity for to come Coming back to what all EDs have mentioned tonight is getting involved, keeping them involved, and getting a better education.